Well, <clears throat> it's, um, it's an honor to have been invited to speak to you this evening. Um, and um, my title, Professional Regulation in an Age of Anxiety, um, I want to explore with you, really, um, how social how social context affects the way in which we use regulation and how over quite a long period of history we can see the way in which professional regulation has developed out of a whole range of other regulatory interests and practices. Uh, when I was about six years old, I had an interesting encounter with a professional. Without warning or explanation, I was taken out of my primary school class by my teacher to do some tests. And in the library of the school uh, sat a figure with their back to the light, tweed jacket, tie, cropped hair. And they passed me some silly tasks to do. At least I thought they were silly tasks. They involved getting bits of cardboard and fitting them into shapes. But much more interesting to me than the test was my interrogator. Of course, I had never knowingly met an educational psychologist before, but that wasn't what puzzled me. I couldn't work out whether the person administering the tests was a man or a woman. And in my six-year-old world of categories, that was quite an important distinction. <coughs> they dressed like a man, but they talked like a woman. So I decided on some empirical research of my own. I slowly pushed some of the bits of the cardboard to the edge of the table, and then, whoops, one of them fell on the floor. Climbing off my chair to get it, I could look onto the table. She was wearing a skirt. <laughs> Problem solved, simple observation. Now I tell this story to remind us that in human engagement, there is never one side to what's going on. The educational psychologist with her bits of cardboard and her research templates to fill in thought she was studying me. Wrapped up in her own intent, she did not observe that I was studying her. And in the regulation of people, as distinct from products or processes or places, there is the same enduring problem. Regulated people have minds of their own. My colleague Douglas Bilton and I explored this in a paper we published called Asymmetry of Influence. Now in the UK, there are multiple agencies regulating <coughs> health and care. They regulate people, places, products, prices, and procedures. We've tried to chart the different regulators' roles and remits in order to elucidate gaps and overlaps, and in some ways to make sense of the differences between organizations. However, whatever map or model we have uh, tried to develop, we have faltered, because making a map or a chart suggests that there's been some kind of coherent design and the problem is that there is no coherent design in our regulatory model. In fact, all these bodies have come into being at different times, under different governments, to suit different purposes, without any intentional design. And the way that they do or don't relate to each other has been largely dependent on the organizations themselves building relationships with others where necessary and expedient, often driven just by the leadership of individuals. Human choices nearly always override regulatory assumptions. And the consequence of so many different regulators is a multiplicity of advice and guidelines to people and organizations on how to act and how not to act. In the UK, guidelines may be produced by many bodies. And this was illustrated in a 2011 article called Breaking the Rules by Jane Carthy and colleagues, they pointed out that there are over 3,000 guidelines on the Department of Health's website. There are 1,000 on the NICE website. 
There are article lists 21 professional bodies and national agencies who publish guidelines for anaesthetists alone. They also found that the NHS library had a list of 152 publishers of guidelines. And best of all, they found 17 guidelines on how to develop guidelines. <laughs> the authors conclude that clinical guidelines, extraordinary and uncoordinated proliferation, confuses staff, causes inefficiencies and delays, and is becoming a threat to patient safety. And the mere existence of guidelines from different sources on the same issue gives rise to doubts and anxieties in professionals that they are missing something. For an individual to try and find their way through is like being servant to many masters. It's a recipe for moral and cognitive confusion. Further confusion and professional anxiety may arise from the asymmetry of influence of different kinds of regulation in the workplace. While the regulators of products, for instance, can exercise direct control through the specification of equipment that is used every day, the influence of professional regulators on the behaviour of their registrants is much harder to determine, both in terms of its nature, its scale and its outcome. So take, for example, the regulation of pharmaceuticals. It's possible to regulate the chemical composition, the dose of each pill, the size and colour of the pill, the number of items in the packaging, the style and colour and lettering on the packaging, the name of the medicine, the patient information leaflet. We can even barcode the medicine and barcode the patient in order to ensure a safe match. We can be pretty sure of all of that. What we cannot be sure of is that human error or intent will not occasionally override all those safety features. Or from a very different industry, think about um, a warehouse. The forklift truck is regulated. It's a regulated size, it's a mechanical strength, it's, its weight, its balance, all of those can be regulated. Wooden pallets are regulated for materials, size, strength, durability. I was very excited a couple of years ago to discover at a conference in Canada that there was a pallet disciplinary committee. <laughs> I like the idea of those wooden pallets lined up to be told off. <laughs> Not only can we regulate the forklift truck and the pallet, we can regulate the warehouse layout itself. Uh, the f we can regulate the areas for storage, the areas for walking, the areas for driving. We can color code the floors. We can um, regulate the packaging, <coughs> the, the storage shelving and the size of it. We can do all that. We can even train the forklift driver. But we cannot totally prevent him from making errors. And nor can we prevent him from letting his five-year-old son sit on his lap and drive when no one is looking. So unlike medicines and all warehouses, people have minds of their own. Over the past five years, Professional Standards Authority has paid considerable attention in the research that we've commissioned to understand that relationship between regulation and professional behaviours. We commissioned a scoping study a few years ago from Bristol University, and Dr Oliver Quick found that few studies have directly affect, addressed this point. He identified regulation as only one of many uh, influences on registrants' daily behaviour, judgments and decisions. While he found that it's more likely that regulatory goals uh, will be achieved when a number of uh, sources influence and nudge practitioners in the same direction, and that regulation which has buy-in is more likely to be complied with, little is actually known about the nature or extent of the f different regulatory forces on people. Professional regulation, for example, had no impact at all on a nurse called David Britton, a nurse in a specialist eating disorders clinic from 1996 to 2002 in London. In the investigation that followed his dismissal, he was found to have had unprofessional contact with 23 young women over 20 years 
ranging from inappropriate remarks to full sexual relationships. Between 1998 and 1999, Britain was engaged in simultaneous abuse of eight patients, all of whom believed that they were in an exclusive relationship with him. He used his knowledge about the vulnerability of young women with eating disorders to manipulate them for his own purpose. What Britain wanted from his workplace was immoral, abusive and self-serving. However, a remarkable feature of his story is the sheer effort involved, the extraordinary self-discipline and calculation required to pursue multiple simultaneous relationships with patients, evading detection over many years. Britain not only manipulated the vulnerable women, but his colleagues and managers as well, who thought he was one of the best nurses around. This case, like some others we see at the authority, provides a rare and distasteful insight into what motivates some people's behaviour in the workplace. Now, the vast majority of healthcare professionals have internalised standards of conduct and hard-won standards of competence. There are in the region of 1.3 million regulated people in the UK, in the UK Health Service. Only about 4,000 ever reach a fitness to practice proceeding. So my organisation's focus is on the small minority who, through their moral failings and behaviours, cause or are complicit in harm or wrongdoing. And looking at the cases that we've reviewed, Douglas and I have suggested three categories of people who get into trouble. There are first those we call adventurers. Adventurers are people who actively and systematically look for personal advantage at work. This includes those health professionals who pursue sexual contact or relationships with vulnerable patients like David Britton, but it also includes other forms of risk-taking, such as planned theft or fraud, the paramedic who stole training manuals, mobile phones, projectors, computers, and put them up for sale on eBay. He was perhaps rather less cunning than some. Uh, the hospital finance director who, with a, with a business partner, built and set up a uh, accommodation for nursing uh, next to his hospital and placed hundreds of thousands of pounds of contracts with his own business from the hospital without anyone knowing. These people are in a sense entrepreneurs because they seek out the opportunities that their work environment presents and exploit them. They enjoy the element of risk taking in their behaviour and they're calculating and manipulative. Our second category we call drifters. These are people who have, whose internal controls are weak, who are reliant on external influences in the working environment to regulate their behaviour. Drifters get into trouble when poor standards of behaviour have become the norm. When management is inconsistent, weak or absent, drifters don't have the inner strength or the moral purpose to maintain their professional standards in the face of contrary forces. Drifters are social conformists. Whatever the environment, they will conform to its norms, even when consciously they know what they're doing is wrong. Drifters are easily led by adventurers who seek to undermine workplace standards so their own aberrant behavior becomes less <coughs> conspicuous. An example of this was a nurse a nursery nurse, Vanessa George, who drew her colleagues into lax standards of personal conduct as part of a strategy to conceal her own abuse of children in her care. The Safeguarding Children Board report describes how her position of power within the staff group was such that although staff became increasingly concerned about her crude language, discussion of extramarital relationships, and showing indecent images on her phone, they were unable to challenge her. The third group we call stragglers. These workers are well-intentioned, but struggle to meet the technical, intellectual, or emotional demands of their job. They lag behind in level of competence and conduct to do a safe job, and they struggle to meet deadlines, to cope with their workload, or to fully understand the technical aspects of their work resulting in errors and mistakes, which risk the safety of patients. Of course, this 
three-part typology is a caricature. But I think these little um, vignettes touch on what motivates people at work and therefore on the relationship between behaviours and regulation. They demonstrate a flaw in the logic of that casual remark that no one comes to work to do a bad job. This is a myth, I have to say, particularly loved of professionals. Some people, rare, but some people do come to work either content to do a poor job or actively seeking forms of gratification through their interaction with colleagues and clients which are disruptive to their work pace and detrimental to the people for whom they are responsible. Uh, stragglers lack the competence or resilience to cope in their difficult situations. This could either be because of weak management or simply a group of colleagues who are disconnected from the pattern of their daily work. The systematic failings in the Winterbourne View care home and the behaviour of the staff, some of you may have either seen the television programme or read about this terrible scandal. Although all the doctors, nurses and managers that could have protected the patients failed, the junior workers who actually carried out the most of the abuse seem to have lost any sense whatsoever of their personal responsibility for the quality of the care that was provided. In the end, though, it was the low-paid, untrained, unsupervised staff who went to prison. A couple of nurses were disciplined. The doctors, the managers, the regulators walked away. And the owners of this private hospital kept their profits in their offshore tax haven. So for none of these types, does regulation appear to be relevant to their thinking or their behaviour? So how have we as regulators come to a place where we don't really know how professional regulation works? Where multiple rules, recommendations and, um, and guidance cause professional anxiety and conflict? And we don't know to what extent regulation is effective in preventing harm. So in order to think about the place of regulation in our contemporary society, it helps us to have a bit of a historical context. And it's not surprising then that the earliest regulations were of trade. In the ancient world, weights and measures, the coins to pay for goods, in a needed reliable exchange. The earliest systems of measurement date from Mesopotamia and Egypt in the fourth millennium BC. Some uh, reliability of weights and measures allowed you to trade beyond your immediately immediate community, you know, allowed you to trade with people you didn't know. And coinage came quite a bit later, around 700 BC in the Aegean world, perhaps a bit earlier in China. And of course, coinage then needed control by authorities in order to main, maintain reliability and confidence in exchange. And the forging and adulteration and clipping of coins has long been a serious crime. Adulteration of food became to be regarded as a risk to trade as well. In 1266, in the reign of Henry III, uh, a law called the Assize of Bread and Ale was passed. It was the first law in England to attempt to regulate the price quality and weight of a loaf of bread and the quality of a glass of beer, probably a jug of beer actually. You, you may be interested now, I was thinking this being the um, uh, anniversary of the Easter uprising, that I should just tell you that as well as being King of England in 1266, Henry's many titles included Duke of Aquitaine and Lord of Ireland. Long gone. Uh, in medieval cities, um, craftsmen formed confraternities based on their trades. Weavers, masons, carpenters, carvers, glass workers, each of whom controlled the secrets of a traditionally learned technology, so-called the mysteries of their crafts. Trade guilds rose in the 14th century, associating associations of art artisans and merchants who controlled their craft and product in a particular town. They were organized as something 
between a professional association, a trades union, a cartel, and a secret society. And they often received a grant of letters patent from the monarch to enforce the flow of trade to their self-employed members and to retain ownership of the tools and supply of materials. The purpose of the guild was to protect the market and not to protect the consumer. Any consumer benefit in terms of quality was purely coincidental. The creation of a cartel remains strong in professional regulation today. Sheila Ogilvy, writing in the Economic History Review in 2004, showed that over time the guilds had a negative effect on quality skills and innovation. Only when their restrictive practices were curtailed did industry and free trade develop. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, made a similar observation. People of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or some contrivance to raise prices. Still seems true to me today. It's interesting to note, I think, that the liberal professions self-governing colleges and councils have survived and even increased their scope over the last two centuries, whereas free trade in commerce has lost uh, the, the commercial uh, associations have lost their power. Free trade, I think, in one, but not in the other. In England, the regulation of doctors dates to the early 16th century. A small group of physicians petitioned Henry VIII to be incorporated into a college. The main functions set down in the college's founding charter were to grant licenses to those qualified to practice medicine and to punish unqualified practitioners and those engaging in malpractice. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? At the same time, it included apothecaries as well as uh, physicians. And it was founded as the College of Physicians and received a royal charter in 15. 18. A hundred years later, the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries was granted a separate royal charter by James I. He justified his decision to the House of Commons in 1624. I myself did devise that corporation and do allow it. The grocers who complain of it are but merchants. The mystery of these apothecaries were beginning belonging to apothecaries, wherein the grocers are unskillful, and therefore I think it fitting that they should be a corporation of themselves. The pepperers, as they were also called, and the grocers were, of course, the forerunners of the apothecaries because they dealt in the, uh, in the substances, the products, the spices from which medicines could be made. And the grocers objected to the apothecaries because it was competition. I should say that the Society of Apothecaries still exists today. doesn't do very much except hold dinners. And so does the grocers' company, but neither of them have a monopoly anymore. The 19th century saw the beginning of an expansion of state regulation. Just as the dissolution of the power of the guilds in the 18th century opened up free trade, so the subsequent exploitative nature of industrialization required the state to intervene. And in 1802, Parliament passed one of my favorite acts, actually, an act for the preservation of the health and morals of apprentices. It had rather limited ambitions. It was to protect children who worked in cotton mills. They would be only allowed to work no more than 12 hours a day. They must receive religious instruction and they should sleep no more than two to a bed. The act had little effect. The inspectors of the act were the mill owners themselves or occasionally local clergymen whose benefice, of course, was in the hands of the mill owner. By the 1830s, reformers were really arguing for increased protection of children, and the 1833 Factory Act was passed. The next few decades saw regulation extended to practically all workplaces, and by 1870s, 
the development of the occupation of factory inspector had actually uh, come about, although they were not themselves regulated. Incidentally, and I just think this is interesting, New Zealand was way ahead of England in this regard. Workers' rights were established in New Zealand in 1840 after a carpenter called Samuel Parnell led a campaign for an eight-hour day. And note, that was an eight-hour day for adults when children as young as 13 could still work for 12 hours a day in England. Parnell said that a man should have eight hours for work, eight hours for his family and friends, and eight hours for rest. And that became uh, accepted in New Zealand as long ago as 1840. Uh, in the UK, the Medical Act of 1858 finally separated regulation of doctors from the colleges of doctors. And the, uh, and the council, General Council of Medical Edu Education and Registration was set up. Its purpose was, had a small element of consumer interest, because its purpose was, uh, in the preamble to the Act, it says... It is expedient that persons requiring medical aid should be enabled to distinguish qualified from unqualified practitioners. So that was quite, quite a step forward, actually, in consumer protection. But that was about it. Uh, everything else in the Act leaves the register and the control of everything firmly in the hands of doctors themselves and did so for the next 150 years. Echoing Adam Smith's remarks earlier, George Bernard Shaw wrote in his 1902 play, The Doctor's Dilemma, no doctor dare accuse another of malpractice. He is not sure enough of his own opinion to ruin another man by it. I do not blame him. I would do the same myself. But the effect of this state of things is to make the medical profession a conspiracy to hide its own shortcomings. No doubt the same may be said of all professions. They are all conspiracies against the laity. I do not suggest that the medical conspiracy is better or worse than the military conspiracy, the legal conspiracy, the sacerdotal conspiracy, the pedagogic conspiracy, but it is less suspected. Then, really, from the late 19th century, regulation took off. And the regulatory law and all the regulations that flowed from it came thick and fast. We had regulation of education, transport, food, water supplies, safety at work, farming, commerce, housing, energy, banking, consumer protection, and health. In health, regulation spread its protective intentions over not only people, and products, but the places where health care was provided, the prices of health care, and the processes and, and procedures of health care. But occupations still clamour to be regulated. After all, everyone loves a cartel once they're inside it. And while at the same time we curse health and safety gone mad and blame the European Union, sometimes falsely, for ever more petty rules, governments almost universally, I think, arriving office promising to cut red tape and leave it having sown many a length of it. The UK Parliament passed a Deregulation Act in 2015. It has 107 clauses of arcane changes to regulations. I've picked out a few. The duration of taxi drivers' licences. The requirement to wear safety helmets exemptions for Sikhs. The weight of knitting yarn, the exemption of NHS ambulances from speed limits, the ability of landowners to erect gates on footpaths, bridleways and byways without local authority approval. Virtually none of the regulations were actually abolished, though quite a few were made more permissive. But the Act concluded, however, by introducing some new regulations. In the Deregulatory Act, new regulations on regulators to uh, a requirement that all regulators, before they introduced a new regulation, should think about a requirement to promote economic growth and to carry out an impact assessment, which has to be approved by the government before they can change any regulations. 
So, the title of my talk, which you may be wondering when I was going to get to that, the title of my talk comes from W.H. Auden's long and rather tedious poem, The Age of Anxiety, a Baroque Eclogue. Quite a lot of, it was published 70 years ago, just as the world was emerging exhausted from the brutality of war. It has been suggested, not without reason, that the only truly memorable thing about this poem is its title. But it does contain this strangely prophetic passage where one character predicts a future of odorless ages, an ordered world of planned pleasures and passport control. Sentry-go sedatives, soft drinks and managed money a moral planet tamed by terror. An ordered world of planned pleasures and passport control. Managed money, a moral planet tamed by terror. And as social mores become more permissive, and look at the liberating for everybody, I think, gay marriage vote in Ireland recently, which was kind of, you know, a wonderful moment for the whole of Europe, uh, the contrast in regulation is that we are restricting further and further and further into people's private lives, into extending regulation's sphere of regulatory control. Whether it's banning smoking in cars where there are children or introducing a sugar tax. Meanwhile, governments are ratcheting up border controls legislating for intrusive surveillance of our digital communications and invading our privacy, increasingly, as predicted by Auden 70 years ago, we are to be tamed by terror. And in our comfortable Western European lives, we're now beset by anxieties. Terrorism, of course, financial uncertainty, our children's safety, whether they're walking to school or online, foods that cause cancer, pandemics, allergies to nuts, wheat or milk, global warming, economic migrants, refugees from war, the enemy within and the enemy without. We are actually healthier than humanity has ever been. We live longer than any generation before us, but we are constantly anxious about illness and death. In the European Community Referendum, debate in England, and I use England advisedly, <laughs> there is a meanness, a real meanness of public discourse, a narrowness of argument and a lack of generosity. It is unedifying in every sense. To quote Yeats' most pillaged poem, uh, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Anxiety about leaving and anxiety about staying are the only arguments that we are being offered. And that mood of anxiety seems to me pervade European politics at the present time. It's probably reflected in different ways in many countries around the globe. Disillusion with the ruling elite, economic austerity for the many but not the few, growing inequalities, the rise of xenophobia and nationalism, all affect social policy in many ways. When we are fearful, we want certainty, simplicity of solutions, and we resort to rules and regulation. In many countries, governments are struggling with a professional regulatory model conceived in the 19th century, implemented in the 20th, and lethargic about change in the 21st. The extent to which professional regulation is written into primary legislation a price that the old colleges extracted for agreeing for the separation of professional representation from regulation makes reform onerous and politically costly. Why take on those vested interests? After all, lawyers, doctors, academics, accountants make up a substantial proportion of all our parliaments. In the UK, two attempts at regulatory form, reform have founded in the last five years, and a third is in progress. In Canada, New Zealand, Hong Kong, to my knowledge, both regulators and governments are aware 
that what they currently have is not fit for purpose, but the political capital and will is not yet ready to take on the professions. An age of anxiety such as the one we live in acts in two ways against new thinking and reform of regulation. First, as I've suggested, we look to rules and regulation when faced with the possibility of harm, as Professor Malcolm Sparrow has it. That such interventions are poorly directed, rarely effective, and have unintended consequences is no disincentive. Something must be done. After the banking crisis, there was much criticism of banking regulation. Too weak, too light touch, looking in the wrong direction when the danger came. Much of that may be true, but as Niall Ferguson has argued persuasively in The Great De Degeneration, it is the dishonesty and greed of some around investment banking and the consequent failure of the authorities to apply the law to them which is the greatest disgrace. He notes a decline in the quality of world governance in four dimensions. Government accountability and effectiveness, regulatory quality and the control of corruption. As the recent Panama Papers have revealed, that adage by millionaire Lenora Helmsley, we don't pay taxes, only the little people pay taxes, remains true 30 years on from when she said it. Something will be done, of course. There will be a global summit. There will be announcements. We will be told that international trade is very important and complicated, that the rules are adequate and that more effort will be put into enforcement and that more transparency will sort it. The second way anxiety restrains change is that change itself makes us anxious. Change management tells us that if you're not be bewildered and confused by change, you have lost touch with reality. So change is hard and change is scary. Better more of the same than radical action. To quote Auden's poem again, lies and lethargies police the world in its periods of peace. So here we are, intelligent, thoughtful professionals, willing to reflect both on how to do our regulatory tasks better and how to create a better <coughs> regulatory system, aware of the weaknesses of both, but unable, it seems, to bring about more than the most modest of changes. As some of you may know, I have increasingly argued that improvements within the current structures of professional regulation, desirable though they might be, will be quite inadequate to meet the needs of the future. In healthcare in particular, we need to merge registration and regulation into a single continuum based on the evaluation of the risk of harm. We need to learn how to regulate for teamwork, to break down the boundaries between professions and not to build them up, to allow for new roles and for innovation and for agility. Those very things that create our anxieties should make us think about where the boundaries of our multiple world should lie. Pandemics have no boundaries. The internet, for good or ill, has no boundaries. Terrorism has no boundaries. But this should not make us want to build higher and higher walls to wrap ourselves in the comfort of inward-looking security. Instead, we need to look outwards. We need to open ourselves to alternative structures, to focus on the prevention of harms, not merely the following of rules. All liberal professions are international. Law, finance, education, healthcare. The solutions to the problems, whether it's to international tax avoidance, to the mobility of healthcare professionals, to infectious diseases or economic vulnerability and inequality, must be international too. The reform of professional regulation is but a small part of these global challenges, but it has significant bearing on improving global governance, promoting probity, and reducing corruption. So perhaps my very modest conclusion to you tonight must be better that regulation is thought about in an age of anxiety than ignored in an age of complacency. And I congratulate this course for helping regulators and others to think about these issues, however difficult they might be. Thank you. Just, uh, just 
as part of the wrap-up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, to speak for a few seconds and to chair the question session, uh, Professor Colin Scott, who is our Professor of Regulation here in the school. We've uh, allowed the college to borrow him for a couple of years to be principal, uh, but he assures us that he's coming back to us. So, Professor Scott. Thank you very much for that welcome, and thank you very much, Harry, for a fabulous lecture. Uh, I've long been interested in my professional interest in regulation, in the model of healthcare regulation developed in the UK, building on this long tradition of professional self-regulation, of peer regulation that you described, and then layering over it you know, your, your organisation as a, what I call a meta-regulator, what I think was referred to as an uber-regulator, uh, where there is a capacity to observe and to steer the behavior of the self-regulatory or peer-regulatory uh, organizations. And you've given us a, a long durée uh, of history uh, as to how we came to the point we're at and have described to us today a challenge for rethinking what we do, how we do it, what effects that might have, and I think highlighted both the scale and urgency of the challenge on the one hand and the immense difficulty, the difficulty for those in the world of professional regulation, the difficulty for those of us in the academy concerned with researching, understanding, uh, teaching, uh, you know, what the challenges are and, and how they, they might be addressed. So like the best lectures, you've given us a huge amount and I think left us also wanting more. Uh, and in that vein, uh, part of the more is coming now in the sense that Harry's very happy to uh, take some questions uh, or I suppose comments about uh, what we've just heard. So I'll throw the floor open to anyone who'd like to uh, make a comment. Heckle if you wish. <laughs> who'd like to start off? Um, well, I, th I, I think you've described the, the problem pretty well. But what I, what I think is there are huge international pressures, which, on, particularly on workforce, which it's going to make very, very difficult to resist change forever. So if we look globally, there are, there are really um, five big things that affect healthcare systems all around the world. Um, aging populations, uh, development of long-term conditions and multiple morbidities, so moving away from acute services, even cancer is a long-term condition now for many, many people. Diabetes is becoming a significant issue. So secondly, long-term conditions. Um, thirdly, growing health inequalities between um, developed and undeveloped countries, but also particularly uh, within um, quite highly developed countries. We have now massive health inequalities. Uh, fourthly, growing cost of health technologies, and technologies I include medicines as a health technology. It's bizarre to me that in every other technology, you know, mobile phones have got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller and smaller. Why, don't, why do health technologies get more expensive? But they seem to. Um, and, and finally, a global shortage of healthcare workers. 
is, I mean, people of the West is poaching healthcare workers from all over the world. There are, there are more doctors from Ghana working in the UK than there are working in Ghana. It's a disgrace, actually. Um, I mean, I know you can argue, of course, that there's the old remittance culture, they're sending money back home and so on, but the, um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa is 24% of the world's burden of disease and 2% of the world's healthcare workforce. So we have this massive problem. And unless we learn to develop new roles and new skills, we're not going to have enough doctors, we're not going to have enough nurses, we need people, lots of different professions who can do prescribing, we need physician's assistants, we need a whole new set of roles in order to make our health services work for, for, our, for our own children. And regulation acts as a barrier to most of those, not intentionally, but for the reasons you raise, about, particularly about its legislative framework. So I do think there are some forces that are beginning to drive change. I think we've been fortunate in the UK, I mean, perhaps because my organization's been there and has had the support of government for, uh, for, for several years now, um, even with changes of political parties. So we've driven incremental change, but we still haven't yet uh, driven what might be the radical change that we're about to see if our current health minister, who does seem willing to take it on, and I mean I can say this because in the public domain he's just, um, he's just made it clear that he wants to see the nine professional regulators in the UK reduced to three maximum. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of proposing one just to, just to really upset the, uh, the chickens. So I think there are pressures um, there are changes, but you're absolutely right. On, until you get a crisis, governments, governments only act on this sort of stuff if there's a crisis. And we don't really want a crisis, so it's not, a, it's not like you engineer a crisis to get change, not in healthcare. Sorry, it was a long answer. Other questions, comments? Ema. I was at a, a talk actually this morning um, uh, on financial regulation, and uh, one of the things that uh, is a huge concern in the area of uh, financial services and financial institutions is leaving aside the regulation, which is voluminous and you know highly legislated. Uh, there's a problem with culture, and I wonder, uh, can you give me any insight into your particular area of, of health of how you inculcate a culture which goes beyond really the legislative and regulatory framework, mm -hmm. which can be embedded in <clears throat> I think there's a, um, a big distinction between regulating banking and regulating bankers. And we, bankers are not regulated, it's banking that's regulated. And in health, of course, we regulate the people. And we train them to be regulated, and we we bring them up with values, and they learn values through their education, just as I hope um, lawyers do here. Um, although Joe was saying to me that ethics was a bit of a problem for lawyers. Um, so I think, there's, um, I think there is a big difference, and I, I actually think we can't expect the regulation of industries to change human cultures. And, uh, and we shouldn't expect it to. And, and we blur those boundaries a lot. You know, people talk about, use the word regulation without being at all clear what they're, what they're talking about. In some cases, they're talking about registration, just being on a list. In some cases, they're talking about regulating, as I've described, you know, processes and products. And so, I mean, what is interesting in banking is what happened to the idea of the bank, you know, the bank manager as a pillar of probity and good behavior in the community. What, what happened to that person? It's not that long ago, you know, that you, you had a named bank manager and they were one, you know, along with the vicar and the doctor, they, they were the pillars of the community. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, th I always say that the way we see how how um, social change has happened and, and regulation stumbles behind. If you, if you think that you know, 50 years ago, 
the big scandal would be for the doctor to have an affair with the vicar's wife. But he could pinch as many nurses' bottoms as he liked. Now it's the other way around. Nobody cares if he's having an affair with the vicar's wife, but woe behind, you know, you pinch a nurse's bottom, you'll be up before the medical council. So, you know, regulation has to understand those changes. And I think but because regulation is always behind the curve, and, uh, you know, I think that... I don't think... I don't think you can regulate quality into an organisation from outside. <clears throat> Obviously, you, you know, the Special Times Authority has been involved in some very interesting research and some very good research coming out. One of the ones that really fascinated me was the issue from the Healthcare Profession Council about not allowing small problems to become big problems. And really, it talked around soft skills that are all where a lot of problems end up, <coughs> the lack of good communication, poor interpersonal skills, um, and looking at regulators, what we can do about that, because clearly this is the remit, but that's the piece that maybe is where we need to be moving ahead on the curve, and I'd really like to comment on where you think regulators should be mm. thinking about this particular area. Well, you'll, you'll know um, that when we, in um, right touch regulation, we say that regulation should provide a framework in which professionalism can flourish. And I'm, I'm always arguing that you can't, regulation is not a substitution for professional judgment. Um, it's a framework in which professionals make their professional judgments. And we've got to a point where we get more and more rule-based, and the more rule-based we become, the harder it is to have any discretion. That's my point about all those guidelines we've got that are completely overwhelming people. So. What is interesting, and you're exactly right, and there's also a, a, a little school of, of thought called um, small ethics, which looks not instead, you know those ethical dilemmas we're all supposed to do about whether we save this child's life or we, you know, go and rescue someone else from, from drowning or whatever. That it's about how do you decide if you're a nurse on a ward to go to that patient who's ringing the bell shouting nurse or this one who needs their catheter changed. And how do, you, how do you make those kind of daily, small, ethical, practical decisions in a way that is, is, is right? And I think one of the problems, to be honest, I don't think regulation can really get into that. What regulation can do is create or try and create environments where that kind of good practice can happen. But, you know, another of my... <laughs> lines is when things go wrong the regulator is never in the room you know because things go wrong between a patient a professional a client a lawyer two lawyers um, you know things go wrong with human beings dealing with messy stuff uh, regulators we're all sitting in an office in London or giving a lecture in Dublin we're no use when things go wrong yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to conclude the formal part of our evening uh, with uh, three short messages. The first to say that the Diploma of Professional Regulation that the school has put on has very obviously been a collaborative venture between uh, professions of various kinds, uh, the law school and uh, Ema and Kira's key contributions to making what happen has been already noted. From the perspective of UCD, this kind of collaboration is very important. As they say in the a certain series of films, the diploma will return. It's obvious that there is a very strong interest and demand in providing formal education training of the kind that the diploma is offered. Uh, but I would say that the collaboration doesn't need to stop at uh, having a diploma, formal, a formal uh, process for education training and so on but extends potentially to other things as well. And it would be very interesting to have feedback on an idea, for example, around a community of practice in professional regulation, a forum which would engage all those who are interested from the professions, from the regulatory bodies, from government, from academia, uh, and elsewhere, all those who are interested in having a forum for discussing the challenges of the kind that Harry is, has set down so clearly in the lecture tonight. Uh, so that's something to reflect on. The first, second message is to thank you all for being here tonight, to thank uh, Personal Dual for their 
a dual person. Beg your pardon for uh, their sponsorship and to reiterate uh, JP's kind invitation uh, that we partake of some refreshment and continue the conversation uh, downstairs immediately after this lecture. Uh, but then most importantly, finally, is to reiterate thanks to Harry for delivering such a stimulating lecture. We'll be discussing it for many months and years uh, because we'll never resolve the things that you've, you, you, you've set out. And in a way, for us in universities, that's a good thing. <laughs> the, questions, the questions remain. Further research to be undertaken, further educational offerings, but they are very much the issues that we must have at the forefront of our minds in both designing and implementing regulation for the professions. And uh, it's excellent to have had such a memorable occasion tonight that you've been the centre of Harris. So thank you. <laughs>